Morton Hansen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, so you got a new book out, Great at Work, How Top Performers Do Less, Work Better, and Achieve More. So you helped co-author Great by Choice, uh, which looked at companies and, and did some extensive research there. What got you thinking about individual performers and tr- looking at and in, in doing the same sort of research you did with Great by Choice on yeah, so, individuals? Um, Yes, in the previous book with Jim Collins, we looked at company performance, but I've always been intrigued by individual performance, and I want to perform better myself, and I'm sure you do, and everyone else does, right? We want to do better work and have better results. And I was intrigued by this concept of working smarter, not harder. So I looked out for advice on that, and what I found was just a fragmented set of advice, lots of books, lots of opinions, not really much research on that topic. And I got very frustrated. I said, you know, what am I supposed to be doing here? So I decided as a researcher, well, I need to do a a large study to find out how can you work smart and improve your performance? And that's what I did. Well, tell us about the research process. How do you, how do you study something like that? Yeah, it's a difficult thing to study. Uh, you need a large data set. You can't just study 10 individuals because people might get at this from different uh, angles. So I decided to study 5,000 people across corporate America. So we got all kinds of industries, junior jobs, more senior roles, uh, men, women, half of the sample is women, and so on. And we had bosses rate um, the performance, uh, self-report, and also direct reports to rate their bosses. So we did a fairly comprehensive study. And we looked at a a whole bunch of factors, right? I I didn't sort of pick and choose. I said, okay, here's a list of possible hypotheses we think might actually drive performance. And then we looked at performance outcome. What was the rating uh, vis-a-vis peers? You know, were you above the peer ranking? Were you in the top 10%, top 20, bottom 50%, and so on? And then we sort of correlated and linked the behaviors that seem to drive that performance difference. And uh, what we found, which is interesting, it's if you really look at it, only seven factors drove the majority of performance. So if you look at it, about two-thirds of the difference in performance among these 5,000 can be explained by seven factors. So that's kind of good news for all of us. It means that if we can focus on a few things and do those things well, we can actually most likely really improve our performance by quite a bit. So going into this, what were your initial hypotheses about what would drive individual performance? Yeah, so interesting. So of course, people have studied this before, so I didn't start uh, from scratch. What we found, though, is that there are some differences in these in these factors that make a huge difference. So one of the key factors is the ability to focus, the principle of focus, doing a few things. Now, you know, Stephen Coe said that, you know, in Seven Habits uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> that's, that's not a new thing to say. But here's interesting what we found though. So we looked at, we measured focus, you know, were people focused or not focused? Did they feel that they were spread too thin, uh, doing too many things, their, their boss giving them too many things to do, and so on? And uh, yes, people who focus, they tend to do better. But here's the twist. There were lots of people who focused, but they only apply sort of average effort to those things they focused on. And then there were some people who were really good at focusing, doing very few things, but they obsessed over those few things. They dedicated everything they had into those few things. And those people perform far better than those who merely focused. I call that principle, do less, then obsess. You got to do both. You got to sort of obsess over the few things. And I chose that word uh, obsession on purpose because it sounds a little harsh, but that is what it takes to be a top performer. You got to go all in, a fanatic attention to detail, go the extra mile, seek perfection in a very, very few things that matters the most. That principle was the most important one in our study. And how much of an influence did it have? Like how much better did those people who did less and obsessed perform than those who try to do a lot? So about 25 percentage points in the performance ranking. So think about that. Let's say that you are a uh, top, you're ranked sort of top 70 percentile. So, you know, 70%, you're better than 70% of of your peers, but 30% are better than you, right? Now, if you are able to master this principle, you will, as a matter of fact, go to the top 5%. So it boosts you 25 percentage point in the ranking. 
I mean, that's a massive amount if you think about it. There's a huge difference being in the top 30% in among peers, like say a Salesforce of 200 people and you're in the top 30% versus the top 5%. Now you're an extraordinary performer. This matters a great deal. And I imagine you have to obsess about the right things, right? So, so how do you figure that out? Yeah, that's the, that's the next principle. So we asked them the question, well, you know, you, if you obsess about the wrong things, you know, you're not, you're not going to perform, obviously. And so we looked into that and, and I call that uh, redesign work for value. It turns out, and this was a big surprise to me, lots of people are chasing the wrong objectives. And so we, we all heard that you got to set some clear objectives and work hard towards the objectives, right? That start with objectives in mind, start with the end in mind. And that's only partially right because so many times people are focused on the wrong objectives. Give you a very clear example. We came across this guy who was running a logistics function in a warehouse for a, a large company. And his job was to send his shipments to corporate customers on time, according to his own schedule, right? So he had a schedule and are these shipments going out on time? And he hit those 99% of the time, which is fantastic. He reached that objective, right? And his boss was very happy. But then they surveyed the corporate customers that were receiving these shipments. And they complained that a third of them arrived too late for when they needed them. In other words, that was a lousy performance because if you are a corporate customer and you're supposed to get these shipments and you're getting them too late, you're no better off. And in other words, this person was measuring an internal metric. When does it leave my warehouse? Versus what I call a value metric, which is when you benefit others who are the beneficiary of your work, which is when do the customers need it? And so what we found is that a lot of people have these kind of wrong metrics. I mean, think about a, a medical doctor. They measure the number of patients they can see in a day, their own internal productivity measure, versus uh, are you providing the right diagnosis and treatment for the patients? Lawyers, they build by the hours, as opposed to are you actually solving the legal problems of your clients? Uh, he, you know, I, I'm in Silicon Valley. Uh, here, people measure... Uh, always, you know, volumes of activity. How many hours are you spending on YouTube as a, as a c consumer versus are you actually getting high quality programming and maybe you should be spending less hours and be not being addicted? So there are these, uh, we have these wrong value metrics. So what we need is value metrics. So what we found is that people who do really work, good work, they first figure out what is the value I can bring in my job? And those should be my objectives. Those should be my metrics. And those are the few things I should pursue. And what do you do? I mean, if you are, you're not your own boss, right? And so you have a, a, someone else setting your metrics for you and the metrics they're setting for you are, are not the correct ones or they're setting too many for you, which is spreading you thin. How do you have that conversation with your boss to do that obsess, do that, you know, doing do less and then obsess? Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it turns out a bit tricky, but we found people uh, who did that and did it well. You need to manage up, which is manage up towards your boss and not just take everything that comes your way as a given. And so you need to learn to say no to your boss. And a lot of people fear that. They fear it because they think if they say no, they will be seen as a bad performer. But the opposite can be true. And so what we found is that people who are really good at this, they say no appropriately. So here's what they do. When your boss comes and says, you know, I've given you maybe say three projects and then the boss comes around saying, hey, could you do a fourth project? And, and you know, if you're going to add that fourth project, it's going to hurt your performance because now you're spread too thin. And you have, now we have a choice. You can either do all four. And what's going to happen then, and we saw that in our data, is that people are then start doing mediocre work. Their meetings are not as well prepared. Their Excel spreadsheet is not as well done. The customer calling pattern is not as well done. I mean, all kinds of things depending on the job. And then your boss is going to say, why, why are you not doing such a good work anymore? Right. Uh, so you, you want to say to the boss, instead of just accepting that fourth project, you want to go and say, um, now you give him a, I can do this additional one. But what should I do first? What of these four, which one should I prioritize and do first? 
In other words, you're putting the burden of prioritization back on the boss. And that's a totally fair thing because they are, after all, the manager. Now, you know, the boss might say, well, can't you do all four? Right? That's a typical response. And at that point, you say, yes, you, could, you can, but the work is not going to be as, as, as good because you are now, in fact, spreading yourself too thin. You need to have that conversation. And it's a totally appropriate conversation to have as opposed to just being the, the recipient of all this you know, all work. And what we found is that people who are outperformers, they have that ability to say no and manage up appropriately. Yeah, I can imagine another response that some people would take or poor performers is instead of being assertive and managing up, they would just get passive aggressive. They'll say yes, but then purposely try to sabotage their boss to say, hey, <laughs> look what you, and that's not, that's not productive. Exactly. And then you go around and you just, you know, you're just uh, complaining to your colleagues, you know, this boss is not managing well and you're just getting fed up and frustrated. And the thing is that if you accept all of that, it's going to come back to bite you. It is because you cannot do excellent work or, or you have to put in 100 hours a week to, to make it happen and then you're going to burn out. So you got to take, you know, have that courage, that assertiveness to stand up and, and, and say those things. So I imagine um, as you do less and obsess, people are, the natural result, you'll work fewer hours and get more done. In your research, like how much did, how much less did top performers work than say mediocre performers? So that's interesting. We looked at hours worked and of course we were thinking, you know, the top performers are, are working crazy hours, right? That's, that's kind of work hard mentality that we have in society. And so we looked at the relationship between hours worked per week and performance. And it's not a, a one-to-one relationship. So this is very important. If you're working 30 hours a week on a full-time job, it really pays to increase that. That's just too low. <laughs> 40 is too low. We found 50 hours in our data set. So this is corporate America across a number of industries. About 50 hours a week is sort of the point where it pays you know, to go to 50. And if you think about 50, that's not, you're not slacking off. You're working pretty hard. And so that's a lot of hours, in fact. But beyond 50, we found that you don't get a lot of extra bang for the buck for hours worked. So when you go from 50 to 65 hours per week on average, you're getting very little extra performance for that. And beyond 65 actually turns negative. So it's like an inverse U kind of shape to this. So the upshot for all of us is, you know, put in hours. Work hard to about 50 hours, you know, give and take, depending on your job, of course. And beyond that, it's not about the hours. It's not about the hours. It is about how you spend those hours. And I imagine that, you know, since you're working, you know, less to, you know, 50 hours, still a lot, but not crazy, that has effects for your personal life, which makes it better, which comes back and carries over back to your work life because your personal life is good. Yeah, I mean, I, Brett, I absolutely uh I think that's a great observation because when you work 50 hours a week on average, you can actually have a personal life. But if you work 65, say, then it's very difficult. You have to put in, you know, 11, 12 hours every day and you have to work the weekends. So you don't have time to come home and do something in the evening. Weekends are going to be spent working for the most part. If you add commute to that, it's going to be crazy. So there's a huge difference between 50 and 65. At 50, you can actually have a personal life. At 65 or 70, it's almost impossible. And that's what we found. We, we did a sort of a, a statistical correlation between hours worked and whether you did do less and obsess and whether you have felt that you had a work-life balance, whether you felt you were kind of burning out and whether you were satisfied with your job. And people who do the do less and obsess and work 50 hours a week to make that happen, they perform the best and and they report less, uh, better work-life balance, more job satisfaction, and lower chances of burnout. That's what the statistical analysis of 5,000 people show. In other words, it is possible. It is possible to have it both ways. You can be a top performer and you can have a good personal life. That's what we found. 
That's, 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 that's heartening to know that that's possible. Yeah, but a lot of mythology around says that you can't. You got to sacrifice. Right? That's, you know, that's what I heard. I started working as a management consultant after grad school many years ago at Boston Consulting Group. And that's what's sort of the message. You got to put in the 80, 90 hours and you're going to have no personal life, you know. And, and that was the mythology. And it turns out to be wrong. Well, another thing you guys found in your research is that top formers continue to learn even when on the job. But I'm curious, like, how do you, how do they manage to fit that in when they're doing less to obsess and they're working, you know, 50 hours on average? How do they manage to keep learning when they already got a lot? I mean, not, not a lot, but they're, they're focused on a few little things. Yeah. It, it goes back to the, the principle of focus. So what we found is that top performers, they, they have a sort of a continuous improvement mentality at work. And they don't spend a lot of time sort of learning or training, uh, but they focus on a few things. So for example, you will have somebody who goes in and says, I'm going to ask better questions in meetings. If I'm a supervisor, we found this person who was trying to get better ideas out of the, out of her team, but she was not able to. So she said, I, I need to lead these uh, meetings we have in a better way so I actually get those ideas for improvements out of my team. So I need to be able to ask better questions. I need to follow up better. There's a whole set of small things I need to do better. And that's what she did over a period of time. She went into those meetings and said, okay, here's how I'm going to ask questions. Here's how I'm going to go follow up. So she spent on average about uh, 15 to 20 minutes a day trying to improve on that particular thing. And that's it. That did it for her. She got a lot better ideas out of her team. They implemented more ideas and the productivity and results uh, for her as a manager just shut up as a result of that. So the principle here is, is, is I call it you know the 15 minute a day. Right? If you can carve out 15 minutes where you reflect a little bit about improve upon one thing at a time. I call that the power of one. Select only one thing, not 10 things, not five things, and try to improve that one a little bit every day or a couple of times a week. That is what it, you know, what it amounts to. Now, I know that you have had Anders Ericsson on your show, and, and he has done fantastic research on the idea of deliberate practice, and, and with a very good book, uh, you know, Peak. And he associates study mostly chess players, uh, musical performers, artists, uh, spelling bee competitors, and so on. In other words, not people working, not professionals. And the question then is, can you, can you use that methodology to improve what, you know, think of those as soft skills at work, to be better at communication, better at meeting, better at prioritizing, better at motivating employees, better at sales, for example. And what we found is that, yes, you can. You just need to modify the approach. I'll talk about sort of a few things you need to do differently in the workplace. But that is what we found. We found people who did this and they did much better as a result. So you need to have that mentality of select one thing at a time, very specific, try to spend 10, 15 minutes a day on that one thing. I love that. Um, so another, I think, myth that we've heard, I mean, it's some people say it's a myth. I think you would, the researcher would confirm that is that we should follow our passion. Um, but you found in your research that there's a difference between passion and meaningful work. Sometimes work that's meaningful, you might not necessarily be passionate about, or something you might be passionate about might not necessarily give you meaning. Uh, can you talk about that, that distinction? Yeah, it's a very important distinction. I think it's absolutely a, a myth. Uh, every time, you know, we get to graduation ceremonies and we had a lot of them this spring, right? We got some speakers to stand on the podium and to say, graduates, I'll tell you one thing, follow your passion and things will work out for you. And, and of course, that person who stands on that podium is a super successful person like Oprah Winfrey and others, right? Uh, so we don't hear from people who follow their passion and, 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 and tanked and had a terrible career, right? Those are not invited up on the podium in the colleges around the country. So we have a massive selection bias here. So in our data set, we can actually look at that because we looked at people and, and the degree to which they felt passion and purpose in their work. Those two concepts are completely different. Passion is doing what you love, whereas purpose is do what contributes. Passion is about what excites you, what the world can give you. 
purpose. It's about what you can do for others. It is about what you can give the world. So they're completely different. And we found that there are people who have one but not the other. You can be extremely passionate for what you do. Like say you are in sales and it's incredible competitive and you get all the adrenaline and it's fantastically exciting for you. But you might feel like what you're doing is not contributing to the world and vice versa. So these are very different. And I call them the people who have both. They have excitement about their job. They go to, in the morning, they go to work every day and they're fired up about their work. And they feel like what they do has meaning, contributes to a, a greater good. Those people perform the best. And why is that? It is because they have more energy in their every hour they spend. They don't work more hours. They just have more energy at work. And that translates into better performance, which makes total sense. We've probably all been in some kind of workplace or situation where we're sitting and we feel like work is drudgery. And we're just sitting around and we get distracted and we look at the internet and we would just want to go home. But if you have passion and purpose, you're much more in tune with work. But it is possible. I mean, ideally you want passion and purpose, but there are performers who can get by on just one perhaps, yeah, but not yeah. for so long. So what we found, we were able to, since we have 5,000 people to study and there were people with different combinations here, we were able to tease this apart. So the worst is to think about it as a, the kind of four categories of performance. The first one is people who have neither. Right, those are the worst. Right. They have no drive at work. Then we get people who have passion but no purpose. They have a little boost in the performance. Then we have people with purpose but no passion. They have an even better boost of performance. And then we get people at both, and they have the biggest boost in performance. So it's sort of like a ladder. Right, right, will. right. So another thing you you guys sussed out that was probably counterintuitive based on a lot of the literature that's out there about performance in the workplace is, you know, a lot of the stuff you hear is about collaboration is is key to work performance. And you hear all those open office spaces where people get together and can interrupt each other. But you found that top performers actually collaborated less. What's going on there? Yeah, there is that convention out there that collaboration is a good thing. It's like dental floss, you know, it's a good thing for you and the more is better. <laughs> that's, that's how we think of collaboration. Can't hurt you, right? And we found the opposite. There are two sins of collaboration. There is under collaboration and there is over collaboration. So we found instances where people under collaborate. Yes, they're silos. The people who should be talking should be working together and they don't. But then we have another problem, which is actually extremely common. And that is that people collaborate on too many things. And that is because we have this mantra out there, teamwork, collaboration is a good thing, so just do more of it. So you get people who schedule meetings, they go to an enormous amount of task forces and meetings, and, and they sit there and they talk, talk, and talk, and they don't have time to really excel and do their own work. And so they are not doing less and obsessing. They're just doing more and more and more of these collaborative activities. So what you have to do is to be able to say, what are the most valuable collaborative activities that I need to engage in? And then say no to the rest or challenge the rest. And again, you have to look at the meetings. Uh, do I need to go to those meetings? Right? Is it po possible? Is it important for me to spend two hours? Do I need to call a meeting? and invite 10 colleagues from five different departments to attend. Is this really necessary? And here we have this problem that, you know, people go to these meetings because they have a fear of missing out. Maybe something important is happening when those 10 people from the five different departments are coming together. So I need to be there. And now you have spent your morning, wasted your morning on something that was not necessary. So we need better discipline here. I call it disciplined collaboration to be able to say these are the important collaborative activities that are going to really improve results and these other ones are not. And I need to be able to select that appropriately. I mean, what are some examples of like important collaborative activities that you found? So again, it goes back to this idea of value. If we are sitting here together and we're going to improve collab, uh, are we going to move the results? So should we be sitting here and coordinating between uh, sales and marketing in a new launch campaign? Probably that's going to be important if we are not coordinated. So let's coordinate on that. And then somebody comes around saying we created a task force to improve 
the use of uh, coffee in the office. Right? I kid you not. I mean, I've seen this. Okay, so <laughs> people say, "All right, do we need to have a committee to look at the coffee use in the office?" I know that sounds a little trivial example, but you're getting stuff like that. So you need to say, "What are the two or three most important collaborative activities that are going to improve the results?" And let's focus on that. So, give another example uh, from a high tech company that I recently worked with here in Silicon Valley. And it was sitting around saying, what are the most valuable activities for us? And the head of marketing said, you know, if you really push me on that question, we have major launches and we have minor launches of product features. And we sort of tend to spend the same amount of effort on both. But where we really should collaborate are the major launches because those are the ones that move the needle. And we should really deprioritize the minor launches. And we need to be able to understand that and, 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 and spend less collaborative activities on, on the minor and put more of the effort into the major because that really makes a difference. Now that makes intuitive sense, but they kind of worked in the wrong way because they thought everything was important. Everything is not important. Some things are more important than others. And I think I've read other and other similar research where they found that when people work by themselves, they're able to get more focused and kind of get in that deep work state. They're able to come up with different bizarre ideas that they otherwise wouldn't come up with in a group setting because they'd be afraid to say it because they're afraid to get shot down. And then, so they had these crazy ideas and then they come to the group with those crazy ideas. And so like, there's something about working by yourself that allows, I don't know, especially with creative work for for interesting things to happen. I think Bell Laboratories was an example of that back in the 60s. Like they'd have like, every person had their own little office and they were working on really hard things, lasers or whatever they were working on back then. And then they would have like cafeteria where they would come and talk. And like a lot of fruitful ideas came from that. Yeah, we need, you know, you're picking up two important things there. The first one is we need to have some time where we can be alone and work alone and focus and come up with creative ideas or spend some time in deep thought. And the open landscape, the cubicle kind of landscape often makes that very difficult. And so when we asked, you know, these top performers, I mean, how do you get that quiet space? How do you do less? How do you make sure you don't get distracted? And people have all kinds of interesting <laughs> tactics for, for doing that. You had people who would come in an hour earlier every day. You would have people who would put on headphones to make sure they wouldn't be disturbed. You had a company where they would have armbands, you know, around the wrist. And if you had the red one on, it meant don't disturb me. So there was a signal and shared signal in the company. You had people who had uh, cubicles and they had drawn fishing lines across the, the openings and put their swimwear, you know, as curtains <laughs> on those, on those fish lines, you know, to kind of protect themselves. And we created these open spaces that don't allow for that deep thought. And so now people are becoming creative and trying to create their own space. And that's very, very important. And we found that people were easily distracted by, by media, uh, social media and other things. I mean, the, the, the problem of, of, of sitting in front of a computer and you get pinged by all kinds of incoming messages makes it very difficult for people. So, I mean, I had myself, uh, when I was writing the book, I came up, I, I was distracted all the time. As you know, writing is really hard. You got to sit there alone for hours and trying to write something. So I came up with my own technique uh, of this thing. So I, I got an old computer, laptop. I stripped it of everything. No browsers, no email software, nothing except just Word. And I took that computer I mean, left my phone at home and took it to Starbucks, you know, for two hours every day. And I just sat there. And, you know, after half an hour, I really want to check my messages, but I couldn't. And so you got to find what works for you to create that quiet space. Well, when people do collaborate, you know, a lot of the literature, business literature, pop business literature out there says, well, you need to collaborate cooperatively, right? Everyone gets a turn speaking. It's done civilly. But I think you guys sound something different that top performers don't collaborate like that. Yeah, that's another convention that you, you're supposed to be sitting in this room and be nice to each other. And and you mentioned before that, you know, if you come to a meeting, you got to so sort of have your own ideas and present them. But it doesn't mean that people are listening to you, that they are engaging with your ideas. It doesn't mean they even allow you to speak up. So niceness is not the formula for success here. It is what I call fight and unite in meetings. You need to have a good fight in the meetings. You need to be able to have a rigorous debate around the ideas. 
And people who fail to do so, they make terrible decisions and they have worse ideas. And that makes sense. If you're sitting around making a decision, say what should be the prices of a product in uh, in a certain market, and people are not able to come up with minority views, with disagreements, and you can't debate that topic, you're probably going to make a wrong decision. So the fighting, now you're going to have a good fight, not a bad fight, right? It shouldn't be a clash of personalities. You're not attacking a person, you're attacking ideas. And that principle is super important. And then you also need to unite. Once you've had a good fight and make decisions, you need to be able to unite behind those decisions. And we found that people who disagree with something in a meeting, they go out afterwards and they undermine it. They question the decision the whole way. They try to kind of sabotage it. Of course, you can't have that. You can't be a top performer as a team or as an individual if that's the way you behave. So I call it the fight and unite. And it's not about being nice. It's about having a good fight. And, and how do you manage up with this? Like, let's say you have a boss that's not on board with it, doesn't understand this. How would you kind of guide them through that? Ooh, that is tough. Right, right. tough. I had a lot of students when I, when I teach this and they come and say, you know, my boss doesn't want to have these agreements. They don't want to be challenged. That's the last thing they want. They just want us to sit around and sort of have an agreement. And that's tough, you know, to kind of go to your boss and say, you know, what, what should we do here? One, one tactic that could work is, is sort of start asking questions. Uh, so you're sitting, a, you're sitting at that meeting and, and somebody says, you know, the boss says, you know, I think the price should be $12.99 for this product in uh, Wisconsin. And, and, and you, could, you disagree. You think that is too high. It's not going to sell. And you have data to prove it. What you could do instead of saying, I disagree with you, boss, you could say a question. You can ask a question. You could say, um, how does that price level compare to uh, competing products in the stores? And are we going to be, are we in the t- top range of the price or are we in the bottom range? I mean, in other words, you're just, you're just asking questions that's going to, ch- that in- indirectly challenge the, the decision. So those are some of the tactics. But, you know, if, if you have a boss or you're in an environment where you cannot speak up and it's impossible and people who do, people who are disagree with something, it's a very toxic work environment. Right. And it's going to be underperforming so you, sooner or later. Right. So you might think about going somewhere else, possibly. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, we know this. There's lots of research, not only mine, but lots of research. You know, teams that are actually able to have rigorous debates perform far better. Well, Morton, we've you know scratched the surface on on your work and great great at work. Is there some place people can go to learn more about the book and your work that you're doing? Yeah, we have a website where you can go and you can take a look. I have some articles, I got some summary notes, and we also have a quiz, an assessment you can take. It takes you about five to seven minutes, and you can see how you score according to the seven principles that drive performance. And the website is www.mortenhansen.com. That's M-O-R-T-E-N-H-A-N-S-E-N.com. Well, Morton Hanson, thanks for coming on. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. My guest today was Morton Hanson. He's the author of the book, Great at Work. It's available on amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can also find out more information about his work at mortonhanson.com. That's M-O-R-T-E-N-H-A-N-S-E-N.com. It's got some quizzes, some other content that fleshes out more what he talked about in the book. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash great at work, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.